so I guess you've proven for the third time that even Jimmy has, uh, can, do, can be a success. <laughs> Uh, there are two other very important people in the audience, and these are Ksenia and Sergei. Please make yourself visible. Sergei there, Ksenia there. They are owners of the mics. In my years, when I was your age, the students were raising hands when they wanted to answer the question from the teacher. Now you should raise your hands when you want to ask a question. Ksenia and Sergei will provide you with mics. Please ask your question, tell us who you are, and surrender the mic immediately, because there are many people who want to ask the questions. And, and yes, I have please. a translation, so if you feel shy about English, you can ask in Ukrainian. Sure. It should be fine. Go ahead. Hello, my name is Marina. I am from Kiev National Economic University. And uh, dear... Um, Dear Mr. Wells, I want to um, ask you a question. As the Internet today covers almost uh, all areas of our life, it's important uh, to think about the social consequences of its uh, use. And uh, don't you think that uh, this causes serious dependence of people uh, on the Internet as a sole um, the source of information in the future? Well, uh, you know, it's interesting because for Wikipedia, one of the things that we're very uh, insistent on is having reliable sources. Uh, and to get to reliable sources, it's really important that we have very old-fashioned editorial processes and so forth. Uh, so, you know, I think whether, when we think about w do people get information from the internet or from some other source, uh, digitally or from paper, I think we should keep those two separate questions. How it gets delivered is a completely separate question from how it gets produced. I think, you know, uh, the future uh, clearly lies with electronic books, uh, magazines, newspapers, and so forth. I don't think paper is going away anytime soon, uh, but I think what is important is that we have good editorial processes so that what information we are getting has gone through a thoughtful process to try to ensure as much accuracy as possible. Uh, so I, I hope that answers your question to some extent anyway. Other questions? The lady in the fourth row. Thank you. Uh, Julia Kisilova, Donetsk National Technical University. My, uh, my question is, my group is planning the creation of academic, scientific uh, resource and uh, encyclopedic resource in the sphere of philosophy. Which way should we choose? The way of Wikipedia, I mean open editing by all users rega regardless of their professional status, or the way of Dupedia, where only the recognized mm. professionals could create the content. I underline we uh, plan in uh, academic, scientific resource. Thank yes. you. Yes, yes, great. Um, so I think that's actually very interesting. So the question is, uh, if you're doing a specialty encyclopedia for an academic purpose, rather than a broad general interest encyclopedia, uh, should you use an open model like Wikipedia or a more traditional closed model? And I think that there's an interesting opportunity to do a bit of a hybrid. Uh, where you know that the final product, because it's written by specialists for specialists, uh, needs to be written in a certain style, to a certain standard, um, then you need you know, the really active participation of experts. Uh, at the same time, uh, I think there would be many people who would be happy to, to work and to help out. And particularly, even for that group of people, um, even if it's a closed group of people, I think you should have as much open collaboration within the group as possible. Uh, so a very traditional model, you would assign one professor to write one article, it would be reviewed by two or three people. Instead, why not have two or three professors all working together and have other professors looking at it, even in particular uh, people from different disciplines or different fields who may say, you know, I need to understand, I'm maybe an economist and I need to understand something from the field of sociology, uh, but the sociologists speak in, in their own language. Uh, if I could have some input to say, look, you're writing an encyclopedia, maybe you need to explain it in terms that others can understand. And what does this term mean? What does that term mean? I think it would be very healthy for the project. So I think this kind of group collaboration where, where instead of having two or three people working together, you have 100 people working together could be quite uh, powerful. And I'm not seeing anybody really attempt that. I think there's still a tendency to think it's either totally top-down and controlled like Newpedia or like Wikipedia, and I would be excited to see some attempts in the middle somewhere. Another question from that part of the audience. Um, Marichka Yurchak, Ternopil National Pedagogical University. 
Uh, firstly, thanks for interesting lecture. And my questions are uh, first, uh, what question would you like to find the answer on Wikipedia? <laughs> and the second one, uh, what are your predictions uh, about the future of uh, copyright law in the World Web? Okay. Thanks you. Yes, great. Um, well, what answer would I like to find in Wikipedia? Well, I go in, on Wikipedia all the time and I find, uh, particularly in English Wikipedia, it's harder and harder to find something that isn't in Wikipedia. Uh, it's com very, very comprehensive. Uh, but sometimes I do, I, I find some subject and I realize, wow, it's, it's quite a short article. It doesn't really tell me what I wanted to know. So, but there's lots of those. I think there's still, as big as English Wikipedia is, I think there's still room uh, for improvement and uh, lengthening and deepening a lot of the, a lot of the entries. Uh, in terms of the, the future of copyright law, I think it's very interesting. I mean, we're going through a period of, of big transition there. Uh, I'm, I am not uh, opposed to copyright law, uh, but I do think that copyright law for a long time has been moving in the wrong direction. Uh, we keep seeing longer and longer term for copyright, um, which is not really consistent with um, what we want to do. My view is one of the problems we have is that copyright is currently one size fits all. And so you have very large commercial interests like Disney um, who desperately want to protect their older films because they're still making money out of them. Uh, and I think, fine, give it to them. I'm not really concerned about Disney's old films. They can make as much money as they want for as long as they want. I don't really care about that. What I care about is the uh, chemistry textbook that was written 20 years ago, has been out of print for 20 years. Uh, no one's doing anything with it. Uh, my community could take it, update it, extend it, give it for free to everyone in the world. And I think that's an enormous opportunity, enormous possibility. And so treating every possible thing as if it's the same thing is not, uh, not really viable. I think the other thing that I would like to see some reform on is, is reform on our ideas about sharing, uh, de minimis sharing, casual sharing amongst friends. The, this, this thing of uh, the record companies, uh, movie studios, uh, suing teenagers for copying movies is stupid. I mean, it doesn't, makes no sense at all. At the same time, when we see something like uh, they recently shut down mega uploads, uh, who are charging people money to access cl clearly copyrighted materials. To me, it seems like that's clearly a large-scale criminal enterprise, and I understand we need to do something about that. Uh, and so finding a new balance uh, where, where certain kind of uses that the public really wants to do are okay. I mean, uh, example, it's not that hard to go on. You can go on uh, YouTube and find videos uh, where the soundtrack has been suppressed. And what's the video of? It's a kid's birthday party and in the background a song was playing. And so they have to cut out the, the, this is ridiculous, right? This is somebody's posting a kid's birthday party and there's a little music in the background. This is casual use, yes. It's casual use, right? This is not, if you want to compare that and say this is the same, if the law treats that as the same thing as mega uploads or as somebody making counterfeit uh, Chanel handbags or something like this. So that's kind of, these are different things. At each different thing, we need to rethink the boundaries to say, what is it that the public is trying to do? Is it really criminal? Is it really bad? Uh, you know, if I hear a great song and I send a copy to my friend, is that really a crime? It's a, you know, and it's, it's the classic case of if you make things illegal that everybody in their normal moral conscience thinks is really no big deal, then you, you create widespread disrespect for the law and it makes it harder to do something about the real problems. So I think we're, we're, we're probably beginning to see uh, movement towards uh, working through change and I think, I hope we've played a big part in that or that we will continue to play a big part in that. When we did our protest and shut down English Wikipedia for one day, 10 million people contacted the US Congress to protest this proposed law. I think now when Congress thinks about regulating the internet are changing copyright law, for the first time they're going to think, oh, we better think about what the people on the internet think, not just what Hollywood thinks, because a balance has to be struck here. Another question from Sergei. Good afternoon. My name is Ina Bituk. I'm from Sumer State University. I would like to ask you what was your internal motivation to create a non-profit project? Thank mm. you. Yeah, so um, when I first started Wikipedia, actually when I first started Newpedia, uh, it was just a project within my existing uh, company. And I, w I didn't really think of it uh, so much in terms of for-profit or non-profit. It just was an idea I had, something I wanted to create. Uh, I didn't think a whole lot about business model. I just thought this is something that needs to be done. 
Then came the dot-com crash, and there was no real possibility of raising money or, or doing anything. And a lot of the volunteers really wanted it to be in a nonprofit. And I thought about it, and I thought, yeah, it actually makes sense that what I, my dream for Wikipedia is to be uh, something very special in the culture, a cultural icon. It's a, it's a neutral place, a go to, place to think, to reflect, to learn. Uh, and you know, a lot of times, particularly in the early days of Wikipedia, I would be interviewed by the press and people were uh, quite excited because they thought I was going to be some kind of crazy anti-commerce communist or something like this, but I'm not. Uh, I'm quite boring. I think it's good to make money. I think, you know, it's fine. I just think it, there are places where that's, that's the right thing and there are places where it's not the right thing. So uh, for me, it was quite important that Wikipedia become uh, a nonprofit because it's, it's quite neutral and it's something that I think is, it's, it's really helped by the spirit that it's, it's ours, it's yours, it's mine, it belongs to the world and we should make it as good as it can be. Uh, and it's not about uh, making money, even though I'm not against making money. Jimmy, in non-financial terms, have you profited more from your failures or from your successes? <laughs> in non-financial terms, have I profited? Well, no, I mean, in non-financial terms, I can't think of anything that would have profited me any more than Wikipedia. Uh, I mean, it's incredibly rewarding uh, to, you know, I feel this real sense of pride. I feel like I've done something useful, you know? And at the end of the day, what's life about but doing something useful? So, um, you know, that's good. I, Right. I've profited more financially from my failures, I think. Another question from the audience. Dear Mr. Wales, my name is Ludmila Chudova, and I wonder, how do you see the future compromise between virtual and natural in the life of a human individual and its psychics? Be between what? Between virtual and natural. Virtual and natural. Virtual and natural, yes in the ah, life of human beings? Ah, well, it's very interesting. Uh, that is a really good question. So, uh, as we move forward, I think we all spend today more time than we spent 10 years ago uh, with our head in the clouds, our head in the computer, our head in, in the world of ideas. I think that's wonderful. I think that's great. Uh, at the same time, um, it's not what life is all about in the end. Uh, so, I mean, one of the most important things um, I, I I think when people go out on a date, they should put the Blackberry away. Uh, this is the worst thing that anybody can do when they're out on a date for the first time, is sit there and get on the Blackberry. It's very rude. I think when you're spending time with your children, you should put the computer away. I think kids should play with the computer as well. Uh, but I think that we need in our life to, to carve out some time and some sphere to say, look, actually, here I am. I'm sitting down for, uh, well, I had dinner with Victor last night. We didn't pull out our telephones and play on our phones during dinner. It would have been outrageous, you know. Uh, you're, you're with someone, you're with people, you're conversating uh, in person. I think that's incredibly valuable, and we need to always carve out space for that and make sure that we're not becoming too obsessed with uh, technology. At the same time, that doesn't mean technology is bad. I mean, one of the humanizing effects of technology uh, that I've felt in my own life is, uh, you know, I'm of an age when, and I moved, everybody I went to school with uh, when I was a teenager, people moved all over the U.S. in different schools, they went to different universities, and we all lost touch with each other. So the whole group of people that I lost in my life until Facebook came. And then I was one of the first on Facebook, but then slowly but surely all of my old friends came onto Facebook and we've reconnected. And now I visit people and they visited me and uh, I keep, you know, I know you can see pictures of their kids and say happy birthday. That kind of connection to other people, even if it's a small connection to someone you knew 30 years ago, I think is valid. It's, it's real, it's human, and it's something that technology allows us to do. There was a time when you know, if, if you, for your career, you move away to uh, London for four years and then you come back to the Ukraine, while you're gone, you wouldn't have any contact with your friends. Now, if you go to London, you'll have plenty of contact with your friends. You'll just stay chatting with them on Facebook and so forth. I think those real human connections are valuable and that a lot of times when you see critics saying, oh, well, people don't talk anymore, they're just on Facebook, I think they're missing the point uh, in a large part. Now the question from this part of the audience, please. Hello, my name is Larissa Fanasia. I'm a master of uh, uh, Kharkiv International University, and uh, my question is the following. Uh, what are your tips for generating new ideas and how to make them available to other people? Thank you. Uh, tips for generating new ideas. I don't know. I, I have lots and lots of ideas. Um, as you saw in the slides, most of them bad. 
Um, so I never have any trouble generating new ideas. I have trouble sorting the good ones from the bad ones. Uh, so I, I would say uh, a few things that I would say. Uh, one of the mistakes that I think uh, particularly young entrepreneurs make uh, is they, they have some idea and they're so afraid that someone will steal it that they don't want to talk about it to anybody. They don't talk to their friends. They don't talk to colleagues. They don't talk to investors. They don't talk to anyone about it. Um, and I can tell you, I just think that's almost always a mistake. There are very few ideas that are so genius that are also so easy that they can be stolen. Wikipedia, you know, there were plenty of people who had discussed the idea of doing an online encyclopedia. That was not a genius idea. What I did was, uh, I always say I'm a carpenter, not an architect. Uh, I put hammer and nails, I started building the thing and I made lots of mistakes along the way. So the first thing is, to get more ideas, talk about your ideas. Uh, bounce them off other people and don't be afraid people are going to steal your idea. Uh, the other thing is, sort of what I talked about here, don't be afraid of failure. Uh, if you want to do something, just do it. I mean, my view, this is, this is something very cultural and I think it's something that people really need to support their friends and their family members in, uh, is the idea, the simple idea, the person who tried something and failed uh, is a hero uh, as compared to the person who never tried anything at all. I think that's really, really important that, that we should have in our world this spirit of saying actually it's really important to try things and yeah, not everything works out but you're not a loser because you tried something. If you have the idea that oh, this person tried something and they failed so ah ha ha, well great, good on you but you never did anything. Uh, you just got the most boring job you could and, and, and never made any bold statements or never did anything. So I think that that's for me, it's not about how to generate more ideas, it's how to free yourself to express those ideas and to feel confident that you can, that you can do whatever you want to do. And if you fail, hey, you can just laugh at the ones who never tried. So. Ksenia, please provide us with another question. Hello, Jimmy. My, my name is Anne Marozova. I'm a student of KPA. And my question is, which case of blocking Wikipedia articles or the whole site in the countries with strict censorship was uh, hurts you the most? Mm, yeah, so interesting question. So censorship uh, and Wikipedia is, is a big topic. Um, so uh, by far the most comprehensive program of censorship all around the world is China. Uh, China employs thousands of people to work on censoring the internet. Uh, there was a time for about three years when Wikipedia was completely banned in China. Uh, then uh, it was just before the Beijing Olympics, so it's been almost four years now. Uh, just before the Beijing Olympics, they unblocked uh, the BBC and then they unblocked Wikipedia and several other websites uh, because a lot of foreigners were coming to China, so they, they had a period of openness. Uh, after that, I went and visited the minister uh, in, in Beijing, and now I've visited him twice. He's visited me twice in the US. So we have a dialogue with the Chinese. The status today is that Wikipedia is largely available in China, but they still block certain pages. Uh, and the pages that they block are exactly what you would expect. Uh, they block things having to do with the Tiananmen Square uh, June 4th incident. Uh, uh, Lu Xiaobo, the Nobel Peace Prize winner, Ai Weiwei, the artist, um, things having to do with Tibet or Taiwanese independence. It's, it's pretty clear what the sensitive topics are in China and those are the things that they filter out. Um, so today the status with China is um, we don't think they'll block us completely, not without talking to us at least. We have a dialogue. We will never compromise. Uh, my view is that access to basic information is a fundamental human right. It would be uh, I really understood this when Google decided to compromise and go into China and filter themselves, I knew that we couldn't. Somebody had to stand up and say this is a human rights issue, we will never cooperate with censorship. At the same time, we can't force them to not censor their own network. So we're at a, you know, at a bit of a standoff. Um, I think we'll win in the long run, but uh, there was a funny story once. Uh, I, I was speaking to a professor who wanted to host Wikipedia on his university's uh, servers inside China which would involve the university hiring people to censor Wikipedia for us and I said yeah you know I think China is changing I think that the, the approach to the internet will change uh, and uh, he said uh, well it might be a very long time and I said I'm, I'm willing to wait a thousand years uh, which I said mostly as a joke because the Chinese like to think they have a long-term perspective so um, that's where we are today. There are several other places uh, around the world. Uh, a lot of the Arabic countries are filtering the internet uh, based on, um, uh, you know, opposition political leaders are filtered or blocked. 
uh, things like that. As I understand it, uh, I think in the Ukraine there's essentially no blocking of the internet. I might be mistaken, but that's what I read in Wikipedia. Uh, and, uh, but, but, you know, there are, there are problems of freedom of the press here uh, in the Ukraine. It's not perfect, but it's better than it was a long time ago. Uh, I think it's something that everyone needs to be quite vigilant about, is uh, this idea that basic information is a human right and uh, citizens should demand it um, really quite loudly if necessary. Sergei, any questions from your side? Uh, Max and Donov, uh, Keith Hill Academy. First of all, I'd like to thank you for the video once again. It comes extremely useful when finance and analysts are approaching at the universities. And my question is, how did you manage to start Wikipedia from scratch when not a single article was written? And what does it take for this crowdsourcing to be efficient? Um, can you ask again a little more slowly? Uh, what does it take for crowdsourcing to be efficient? What does it take for crowdsourcing to be efficient? Um, right, well, there's a, there's a lot of things to say about that. So one of the first things I'll say about that is uh, I always like to explain why I don't like the term crowdsourcing. Uh, and I think this is quite a, a useful insight, particularly if you're thinking of starting some sort of a project online. So the idea, the term crowdsourcing comes from the term outsourcing. So the idea is uh, I can't afford uh, workers in an expensive country, so I'm going to find some workers in a cheaper country and hire them uh, to do the work. And then crowdsourcing is uh, sort of going one step further and somehow tricking the public into doing the work. Uh, it's this idea that I have a body of work and I want to get it done cheaply. This is the, it's a, the opposite way, it's the wrong way to think about anything like this. What you should think about is, Here's a group of people on the internet who are trying to accomplish some goal. They're trying to do something. They have something they want to do. How can I help them accomplish that goal? So with Wikipedia, you don't start by saying, oh, encyclopedia, how do I get people to write it? Instead, you can start with the idea of, wow, oh, there's all these really smart people online. They're trying to share information with each other. What, what could they use? What could I do to help with that process? And actually, very early on, that was part of the thought process of Wikipedia. I had a friend who I'd been, a professor who I'd been, he was very patient with me. We had a long email dialogue for about three years about philosophical topics. And I realized at the end of three years, we had written two or three books together uh, that no one would ever read because it was just emails back and forth. And I thought, wow, what if people could maybe build something together? And there's all this energy to do that. So to make crowdsourcing efficient in that sense, if I accept the question, although I complain about the term, I think the most important thing is you don't start with some work you want done and think about how to get people to do it. You, you start with the people. What is it they want to do and how do you help them do it? Then you can do something quite efficient. Do you remember the first article that was published on Wikipedia? Uh, nobody knows the first article that was published on Wikipedia. It, it was lost in the history of time. In the early days, the early version so, of the software... So there is a question to which Wikipedia does not have there, an answer. There is a question. But I do know what the first words in Wikipedia were. Uh, when I first downloaded and installed the software, um, I typed uh, hello world and hit save and that was the first words in Wikipedia which is uh, it's a classic programmer thing when, when you learn a new programming language you're supposed to write a hello world program just to sort of learn how to print out a statement uh, so this was the hello world for Wikipedia a question from there please <clears throat> Senia Thank you. My name is Anna Chudova. I'm a student of international business of Kiev National Taras Shevchenko University uh, Mr. Wales, I would like to know your opinion on whether the internet is improving the quality, the quality of life of an individual. Well, yes, I think it is. Uh, I think that the internet is improving our quality of life in ways that are obvious and less obvious. Um, you know, the uh, the obvious ways we all use Wikipedia to find things out, even to find you know Google Maps directions, you know, uh, things like this. If you want to meet your friends somewhere. Uh, you know, you can email, it's just, it's, it's great, it's improving your life. But the subtle ways it's improving your life, I think, are in, in a way much more important. And that is, has to do with global connectedness, uh, the ability for people to use the internet as a tool for social change, uh, to come together and demand uh, better, more responsive leadership, uh, more transparent governance, all those kinds of things. I think those are all really, really important. Other subtle effects have to do with uh, the ability of researchers all around the world to collaborate together in, in much more effective ways. Pre-internet, you can imagine, uh, if you're a, uh, in, in 1950, if you're a professor in Berlin and you want to work together on a history project with a professor at Harvard, mm, wow, it's a big, you know, you have to send documents back and forth in the mail, it takes weeks. 
Now you're constant conversation. You get on Skype, you talk. You know that kind of collaboration is incredibly powerful, uh, and is really transforming the way people uh, generate knowledge. So yeah, I, I think it's really helping us all in, in amazing ways. Any, Ksenia, please, to the gentleman in the middle, right next to you. Yes. <clears throat> Um, my name is Edward Gertsev. Um, I just finished school three days ago. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'd like to ask you, uh, nowadays Ukrainian and Russian websites, uh, unlike American and European, usually offer free contact. Do you think it's a step back or forward in developing or with engine? They, they usually, I'm sorry, I didn't quite get it. What about free content? They have free content or they don't have? They have free content. Oh, that sounds good. Uh, our websites have free content, uh, yeah. unlike American, European. Yeah, I, I, I guess I'm not sure I agree with the premise of the, of the question, because of course a lot of American and European sites do have free content. Um, I mean, I, I, so I'll just speak to a more general topic that I think is in the neighborhood, which is if we think about uh, free content, you can have a spectrum all the way from as free as Wikipedia, meaning not only is it free as in beer, like free beer, you can drink it, but free speech that you can copy, modify, you can do things with it. And you have free things like, uh, you know, you can read the New York Times for free or you can, uh, whatever, go on YouTube and watch little film clips for free. Um, all the way up to things like paywall, uh, newspapers where you have to pay to access, um, to even subscription services, paid things like Hulu. And I think that all of them have a place. I think that we're not going to move uh, at all to a world where everything is free or where everything is pay. I think we'll always have a hybrid situation. Wikipedia will always be free and to download some movies will cost some money and, and so forth. And I think that's completely fine. So I don't see any overall trend and nor do I think that any particular place on the spectrum is necessarily a bad thing. So. Dr. Klitschko, I presume. Добрый <laughs> день. It's right here. Yeah. My name is Vladimir Glitchko. Yeah. I'm a former student, <laughs> but I'm still studying, still learning. And first of all, welcome to Ukraine. I hope oh, you feel great you. here. Yeah. It's such a delighting moment to have you here. Oh, thank you. It's great. I have a question for you. You've been talking about failure and option. I mean, it's not an option, of course, for you as for many people. But uh, what is the percentage? of the mistakes of Wikipedia, because we're all going to Wikipedia, and, uh, <laughs> yes. and I know not all of the time the information is 100% true. Yeah. So there's a certain percentage of a failure. Yes. So what is, how high is that? And of course, I was very, very disappointed that Ukraine is behind China <laughs> in like three positions. So uh. I, I guess, I guess that's about all certain um, restrictions of Chinese internet. That's why China landed on the <laughs> 11th place. Is it true? Thank yeah. you. So, um, yeah, so one of the reasons, China would be much higher, except that they, it was banned for three years. I mean, they have over a billion people, so when the Chinese get to type in, they can type a lot. But um, <laughs> in, in, in general, uh, that, that is why. So then, uh, so the first part is that it's about the quality of Wikipedia. So. There's a few things we know about the quality. So one of the things that I always try to encourage is more academic research into the quality of Wikipedia. Because I think socially, it's one of the most important resources. And I, you know, I do think that we as uh, humans on the planet need to have some concern about the quality of information. And obviously, Wikipedia is a big piece of it. Unfortunately, there's very little academic research into the quality of Wikipedia. So the things that we do know, um, when we've seen academic studies into the quality, uh, Wikipedia is comparable to a traditional encyclopedia. Uh, that doesn't mean it's perfect, uh, but I think one of the interesting things, so a few years back, it's quite out of date now, but a few years back there was quite a famous uh, uh, article published in Nature, the premier scientific journal, uh, comparing articles from Wikipedia to articles from Britannica sort of the, the major flagship encyclopedia. Uh, and what was discovered at that time, and this was many years ago now, is that on average the Wikipedia entries had four errors per article 
and the Britannica had around three errors per article. So Britannica was better than Wikipedia at that time. Well, I think what surprised people about that study more than anything else is that Britannica articles had three errors each in them. It's a lot of errors if you think about it. I don't think it's a lot of errors because I know how hard it is to do good quality uh, reference material that, you know, there's always going to be errors. You're always going to be struggling to find the errors and fix them. Uh, and what counts as an error? Sometimes it's, a, it's an interpretation or a bias or, or this kind of thing. Uh, I would say, in general, the Wikipedia entries are comparable to traditional encyclopedias. Uh, in some cases, uh, the German uh, language Wikipedia uh, was compared to the online edition of Brockhaus and, and won across the board uh, on all quality metrics. But that's the German Wikipedia. The Germans are uptight about quality. So, um, so I think it depends. So one of the, there, there's a few things I think we should think about here. So one is, uh, once we go to the, this question and we say, well, look, we know Wikipedia is not perfect. Uh, there's two questions. One, how do we improve it? And two, uh, how do we best use it knowing that it's imperfect? So how do we improve it? For me, that has to do with bringing in more editors, more volunteers, uh, improving the software to help people monitor things better, to help people uh, find and flag and mark errors, uh, to say, look, I think something's wrong here, to bring more attention. There's a lot of work still to be done in that area. The other question is, how do we use Wikipedia? So one of the great things about Wikipedia is we tend to warn you uh, when we think there's a problem. So you'll see on an entry uh, that the neutrality of this article has been disputed, or you'll see the following section doesn't cite any references. And I think that's great that we say, ooh, be careful here. We are not so sure about this. And I think that's really important. I think that we should be teaching students uh, really how to be critical readers, how to think about these kinds of things. So if you read uh, a sentence, um, and it sounds outrageous, you should say, wow, that, that's surprising. Is there a source for it? And, well, if there's a source, you go and check. Oh, what's the source? Is it a good source? Oh, wow, the New York Times reported that someone did say this. Or, actually, the source didn't quite say that, so I'm going to go back and tell the Wikipedia. So, we, uh, the truth is, we've always needed to actively engage with knowledge. I think Wikipedia, for the first time, gives people the opportunity to really do that in real time. You can ask the people who wrote it. Say, well, why does it say this? I don't think this is true. Uh, whereas, if you read something in a newspaper that you think is not true, or in Britannica that you think is not true, it's just a sort of a thing handed down to you and you have nothing to do about it. So I think the quality is pretty good. I think it should be better. I think we should always strive to make it better. Um, but I also think we shouldn't be in a panic about it. Uh, certainly uh, the, the days have passed when a uh, professor should say, oh, I tell my students don't even look at Wikipedia. I mean, that's ridiculous now because as you see from the hands that go up in this room, 100% of all students are using Wikipedia. Uh, the real thing we should be teaching is how to use Wikipedia. When, when do you trust it? When do you not trust it? And how do you make that decision? So. Any questions from the rear of the audience? Ksenia. Good afternoon. Mr. Wells, it's really interesting to know what is the most important goal in your life today as you realized a great project in your life. So what's important now for you? It's also rather interesting to know who's asking. Uh, my name is Oksana. I'm from the Precapathian University. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, well, I think we can talk about this in two ways. If we, if we talk about uh, just my professional life, my goal is still a free encyclopedia for every single person on the planet in their own language. And there's a lot of work left to do in that, particularly for uh, the languages of the developing world. We have we're, we're growing really fast in India, but a lot of the Indian languages are still small. Uh, we have only three languages in Africa that are doing uh, reasonably well, but they're still quite small. All the other languages of Africa, we have almost nothing. So I still have a lot to do on my main goal of a free encyclopedia for everyone. Uh, on a personal level, though, I mean, I have to say I have two children, and, and making sure they uh, grow up properly is my most important goal. Another question from the front row. Um, good afternoon, Igor Mazapa, former student, now CEO of Concord Capital Investment Bank. Uh, Jimmy, my question is, um, as um, the intranet is becoming an integral part of our life, the penetration is really high and it's going up. Uh, many of your colleagues, actually, people, distinguished people who invented many other interesting things, uh, they are referring to intranet not as a source of information or a knowledge, but rather as a, an emerging global brain. 
the brain which would help us to make a decision, to find a girlfriend, to help us make love, whatever. Uh, what is your view on this? What is your position? What, what is the future of the internet? What is the future of our life? Yeah, well, uh, you know, the internet is, is more and more a part of our lives. Um, and it's, it's, you know, it's moved from, uh, from the desktop you know, onto our phones and now it's with us everywhere. That is only increasing. Uh, I think a lot of uh, things like uh, metaphors about the global brain and things like that, eh, it's interesting in a science fiction kind of way, but uh, uh, so far computers are real, s very stupid and uh, we're a very long way from artificial intelligence uh, beyond some very basic things. So mm, I don't foresee a, a radical transformation of human life uh, in that kind of science fiction way anytime soon, although who knows what happens 100 years from now. Um, you know, in terms of uh, you know, other trends that I would see, I would say, you know, things like, uh, you know, teaching us, uh, I don't know about where, how to find a girlfriend. I think you're still best off in school and meeting people in person, but uh, I don't know, internet dating is getting to be pretty big, so who knows? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I, what I always say about th this kind of question is, this is where I always revert back to saying, I'm a carpenter, not an architect. So sometimes these big vision questions, uh, one of my favorite one is, what's the next big thing on the internet? And I always say, if I knew that, I would start building it today. So uh, I think in many ways, none of us knows what, what will come in the future. You mentioned that you should put away your computer while talking or playing with your children. How to make it that your children put away their computers when talking <laughs> to you? Uh, it's a really good question. Um, my uh, my one-year-old is absolutely obsessed with the iPad. Uh, she loves it. Uh, and there's these little baby games. I think they're great. I think they're good for her brain and all this, but it's a bit of a pain in the neck. Uh, I can barely use, you can't use the iPad in the same room with her because she's, she, she wants it. Uh, so we have to put the iPad away and do other things with her. But uh, yeah, I don't know. The internet's pretty cool, so. Well, another question from there. At least, you know, I, I will say this. There was a period in time when parents would complain, all the kids want to do is watch TV. And if, if we move to a, a new era where all the kids want to do is read Wikipedia, I think we've stepped forward a little bit anyway, so. All right. <laughs> the question from there, please. Yes, the gentleman. Okay, thank you. I'm Alex, PhD student of cybernetics department, Kiev National University. And I want to ask you, my brother started the non-profit internet project. Should he be prepared to put his face on the banner asking money? Mm. What is the, uh, is it hard to manage non-profit project, yeah. the budget of this project? So one of the, so one of the really interesting things about Wikipedia is our business model, uh, which is that we exist primarily through donations, small donations from the general public. And this is why we, you see my face up there once a year asking for money. Uh, just as a side note, I, I don't like having my face on the banner, but we find that it brings in almost twice as much money as almost everybody else. We had one guy this last year, Brendan, whose banner performed as well as mine, sort of a heavy metal looking dude. People love giving Brendan money, I'm not sure why, but uh, here's the problem. We have 470 million visitors every month. So when we ask for money, it, one million people give money, uh, that ends up being enough money for us, but that's a very tiny percentage of the readers ever bother to give money. So therefore, the monetization is quite poor, which means that if someone's just starting a project, um, they, and, and particularly most projects don't aim to be a universal global encyclopedia that everyone will have. So you can have a nonprofit project, and you may think if it's really successful, 100,000 people will use it, and then if you do the math and you think, well, are they going to donate, it's not exactly clear. So I don't think that this is a business model that will work for every kind of project. Uh, I think that, it, that for many kinds of social projects, uh, there's other possibilities, subscription model, uh, advertising model, more traditional grant models where uh, philanthropic foundations think, oh, this is worth doing, so we'll, we'll give $50,000 to, to help make this happen. Uh, one of the things that I encourage people to do uh, is to think about uh, social entrepreneurship in a different light. I mean, if, if all we think about is you have two choices in life. One, you have a for-profit business and try to make as much money as possible with no regard for any other values. Or two, you're going to live in poverty and do a non-profit thing. 
That's a really sick way of looking at things. What we should have is the ability to say, look, I'm going to have an ethical business that is a business. It's for profit. But we're going to build it into the structure of the company that we're not just about for profit. We want to make profit, yes, but we also have this bigger picture, other values we want to achieve. And I think projects like that, many of the projects I see people doing that they think should be non-profit, I think actually there's a possible business model here and why not do both? Why not have a, you know, a hybrid kind of organization? So, I don't know. It depends on the project. A question from closer to the stage. Uh, my name is Maxim Vysotsky, Kyiv Institute of International Relations. And to uh, get in, again to the topic of non-profit Wikipedia, uh, you know it is growing every day and you have to have more and more employees. Is it hard to support stable work of Wikipedia and don't you plan to use some ads or some kind of getting profit for it, uh, for it in future? So, uh, in terms of, you know, Wikipedia and the survival of Wikipedia and the scalability, we feel very comfortable. Um, as we get more traffic, as we get more viewers, we get more donations. Uh, we've gotten more and more donations every year, and in the last two years we've had the most successful fundraiser in terms of amount of money, and we've done it in a shorter period of time each year. So, as we get more scientific about the banners, and we get more thoughtful about the messaging and we, and we do A-B testing and so on, we're able to bring in more money in a shorter period of time. And the amount of money we bring in is enough. It's not, uh, it's not as much as, I mean, you know, in any kind of enterprise you can always say, oh yeah, we could use another $30 million or $100 million, but it's enough. It, it, it works for us. So in terms of necessity, uh, I would say no, we don't need to put advertising on or anything like that. Uh, in terms of um, if it did come to the point, if we needed to put ads on Wikipedia in order to survive, I've always said yes we would. I don't think that'll ever happen, but yes we would. The other interesting question that I always say is, as we make the decision to not have advertising, we always need to make it in a responsible way. We need to think about what are we turning down and why. Uh, and, and so far the decision continues to be that we, we don't want to have ads. But, you know, if we could bring in one billion dollars and give it to charity uh, for some projects in Africa or something, should we do that? And I think it's okay. Whatever answer we, the public, our community, our board, whatever we come to, I think is okay. But we have to do it in a thoughtful way uh, and, and think about if it's the right thing to do. So I, I'm really happy that we have the luxury of being able to make that decision. We can make it in the most ethical way. We don't have to make it because we're forced to make it. So. Because of that, I think there's no hurry uh, to, do, to do anything. Ksenia, any questions from your part of the audience? Yes, please. My name is Vyacheslav Tros, student of Kyiv Polytechnic Institute. Uh, Oksana has just asked you about your uh, current uh, life goal, and I want to ask you about uh, your previous life goal. I mean, did you have one, and did you know what uh, you want or going to do in the future when you were 20 years old? Um, well, I don't know. You don't know whether you had a previous uh, goal or previous life. I have to rewire my m mind to think about. Uh, yeah, I think, well, when I, was, when I was 20, I was in university and I was studying finance and um, I wanted to uh, go to Wall Street and make millions of dollars. And then I did and it was fun. And I didn't make millions, but I had a good time. Uh, I mean, I think for me, I, I guess the, 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 the reason I'm struggling with the question is because I think I don't think in those terms necessarily. I mean, until Wikipedia came along and I said, ah, this is, uh, this is worth doing, this is what I like doing, this is what I'm going to do. Um, I, it was more, um, I get up every day and I just think, what's the most interesting thing to do? Uh, and even now, uh, in my current life with Wikipedia, I've arranged my life that, you know, I live in London, uh, we have an executive director of the foundation who manages everything, my for-profit company has a CEO, uh, in the management structure no one reports to me directly except for, you know, board meetings and things like that. And the reason for that is I'm like a terrible employee and uh, if I have to turn up and do a job every day I'm really bad at it. What I like to do is uh, get up and say, oh yeah, Victor invited me to come to the Ukraine, so I'm going to go to the Ukraine and talk to some students and things like that. So. Even when I was younger, though, I always knew that about myself, that I just like to do something interesting. Uh, and that's a plus and a minus. It's a plus, it helps you be creative, it helps you be an entrepreneur. Uh, it's a minus because sometimes you actually do have to spend three years like going to work every day. So 
Uh, I don't know. Don't don't look at me for advice on that. So terrible employees become brilliant employers. <laughs> well, or you know, absolute failures. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I wouldn't recommend this mindset necessarily. Right. So. Question from the lady in the second row. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Wales. Um, thank you for coming. So my name is Darina. I'm from the Institute of International Relations, and I really want to know your opinion. So what do you think? Does internet altruism have any future? Does internet altruism have any future? Well, yeah. Um, I, I'm never quite comfortable with the, the word altruism, which has very specific connotations for me. But if we mean charity, if we mean benevolence, uh, yeah, I think there's a, a lot of future. I mean, certainly for us, it's worked very well. Uh, I do find there's an enormous spirit of giving uh, amongst people all around the world, um, even in small contexts. Uh, you know. Um, uh, inside the context of a, a video game like World of Warcraft, people are very helpful to newcomers and helping them learn how to play. Uh, all kinds of communities online, uh, sharing knowledge, uh, email. You know, you can email almost any professor in the world. Uh, maybe not the most famous, famous professors, but you know, pick a, pick a random professor at MIT who's not a super famous professor, and you ask a thoughtful question, and they'll answer you. I mean, just because, oh, interesting question came in the mailbox. And they go, yeah, well, you should read this, you should read that. It's amazing. Why did they do that? Just because that's human. People are very friendly for the most part. So uh, I think that there has been this view uh, sometimes of the online world as incredibly hostile. I think that was due to bad software design. Uh, you know, if you think about people you meet, almost everybody you meet is, is perfectly nice. Uh, you know, maybe one in a hundred are in, very annoying, but even the annoying ones usually aren't evil. Uh, but, you know, the vast majority of people are very friendly and nice and, and are happy to help out if somebody asks them. Uh, so I think a big part of, you know, internet charity, internet benevolence, internet helping people out, uh, has to do with just asking people in a nice way. Um, you know, hey, I want to... I want to get together and do this project, and uh, it's going to benefit these people here and, and for this reason. And if you ask them, they'll say, oh, yeah, okay, that sounds interesting, I'll do that. Or they'll say, mm, no, I'm busy, but, you know, I think it's fine. Yeah. Ksenia, any questions? <clears throat> There's a hand right next to you, to, the, to your left. Yeah. Uh, my name is Alexander. I study international business at the Institute of International Relations. Uh, do you plan any kind of integration of Wikipedia in any social networks, and actually, why don't you have any kind of likes from Facebook for people to share the articles they like with their friends, yeah. to praise them, admire them, something like that? Yeah. Um, so uh, the, at the present time, we don't have any plans uh, for this. The, the only thing is we do have uh, Facebook takes some content from Wikipedia and makes community pages out of them. And um, I don't know, that's something they're allowed to do under the license, and they asked us, and we helped them with the technical aspects. But in terms of uh, integrating uh, Facebook likes and things like this, uh, or like Facebook Connect logins and that sort of thing, I think we're very unlikely to do that uh, for two reasons. One, uh, we're very vendor neutral. Uh, we're like the Switzerland of the internet. We try to be completely neutral in every regard, so we don't want to favor uh, you know, Facebook over LinkedIn or MySpace or Twitter or anybody else, and either we have uh, 50 like buttons for every possible service out there, or we have one just for Facebook, and we, it's just not natural for us to favor one vendor over another. Uh, the second reason has to do with people's privacy. Um, I'm not, as, as a person, I'm not that concerned about, you know, some people are quite paranoid about Facebook knowing everything in the world about everybody. Eh, I don't worry about it so much. It's Facebook, you know, it's fine. Uh, but I do think for Wikipedia, it's not the right thing. I, I wouldn't want to set up a system so that Wikipedia knows every, I mean, so that Facebook knows everything that you're reading uh, in Wikipedia. I think that's very personal. What you want to learn about can be very personal. It can be personal um, because uh, maybe you have uh, some disease symptoms and you're worried about it and you want to learn about it. Or maybe uh, somebody's got some questions about sexuality or maybe they like Britney Spears, um, some horrible thing like that. Uh, and it's embarrassing and you wouldn't necessarily know. I mean, I find it quite disturbing. Uh, just recently I, I clicked um, on a news headline and I, I accidentally had sort of accepted an application and suddenly on my timeline it, it told what I was reading uh, in the news headlines and well fortunately the only thing I ever read in the news is Ukrainian politics so it was fine but come on it's funny. Uh, Ukrainian politics is very interesting you have to admit. Uh, always some good stories there but, uh, but no 
I think that's disturbing that you, you're, you're minding your own business on the internet and suddenly whatever you were doing shows up on Facebook. It's disturbing. So I don't think we would ever want to participate in something like that. Uh, the other things, you know, things like maybe you're reading something in Wikipedia, maybe you're reading about a certain country, and then the next day you see advertising all over the internet based on what you read in Wikipedia. I just don't think that's right. I don't think it's what I, I want us to be. So I don't think we'll ever do anything like that. So. Sergey. Uh, Eugene Grosdetsky, physics faculty, Kiev National University. Do you think that uh, the model of Wikipedia conflict resolution can be used for uh, transforming a uh, state government mm. system? If yes, in what way? Yeah. Well, thank you. So the, the, I think this is a really interesting question. So within Wikipedia, we have a wide variety of dispute resolution mechanisms. We have an ability to work together on a text uh, that oftentimes, it's not perfect, it's human beings, but oftentimes you can get people from very different viewpoints to come together and find some text that they can agree on. And there is an analogy from that to the world of uh, lawmaking or regulation, where you have very different interests and people may generally agree we need to have a law about something, uh, but the exact details are subject to a lot of competing concerns. And could we all work together using a wiki type uh, model uh, to, to hammer out something that everybody would agree is basically sensible? I think it's. I think there's some hope for that. I think there's some interesting things. I've seen interesting projects of uh, a couple of uh, political parties. Uh, the Green Party in Austria was one example I was told about, where they worked on their their election manifesto in a wiki, not open to the general public, but open, you know, within the within the party. Uh, and apparently, it worked quite well. That they were able to strengthen the document. Uh, they were able to get, you know, one of the problems that a party like the Greens have is that very often they're their manifesto preaches to the converted, you know? They write it for themselves, and everybody else in the world is like, wow, those crazy greens. And, but they have people in their community who are like, wow, you know, if you say it that way, you're gonna offend a lot of people, and we can tone it down here and maintain our principles, but present it better. You've got some people who are better at this and better at that, so having mass collaboration on the document generates something that was stronger, at least in, in some people's view. So I think that there are some possibilities uh, here. And I do think it's, it's one of the most important questions, because when we think about things like uh, say, uh, what, what people call a, you know, a Twitter revolution or a Facebook revolution, uh, Arab Spring. So now everybody goes out in the streets and they protest something and they demand a change. Okay, that's great. Now, you, now the, the, you know, the tyrant has fled the country. Now you actually have to build institutions and build governance and so on. And that's a bigger job and harder. And I think that part of what I hope the internet can contribute to is not just sound bites on Twitter, which are great for getting people to go out and rally in the square, but actually deeper, more philosophical conversations. What kind of governance should we have? What kind of laws should we have? What kind of transparency should we expect from our institutions? And can we come together and start talking about those things in a deeper way so that amongst young people, we have more people who are trained and ready to take leadership positions who deeply understand those kinds of issues? I think it's incredibly powerful and something that we should all be really excited about, but we really have to take action uh, to make it happen. Ksenia, do you have another question for Jimmy Wales? Yes. My name is Sergei Karolenko. I study information security in National University of Information Communication Technology. Well, uh, what is your opinion, opinion about uh, organization Anonymous? Thank you. Organization? Anonymous. Anonymous. Oh, Sorry. Anonymous. Anonymous. Um, well, I'm not sure it really exactly exists. I mean, it's a, it's a name for sort of broad movements and some people, I, I don't know. I mean, in general, I would say, I don't know. I mean, it's so amorphous, I'm not, I'm not really sure uh, what to make of it. I, I, can, I can elucidate some principles. Uh, I think it's really important that people come together uh, online to protest things, to take action. Uh, I think it's not okay to uh, be angry with a particular website and to um, 
engage in an illegal denial of service attack. I mean, that's censorship. It's using the force of a combined group of often hacked computers to force someone else to be silent. And I think what is ironic about it is they very often would do so, but on a premise of freedom of speech, which I think is contradictory. Uh, so I don't think people should do that. Um, other than that, I mean, I think it's just such an amorphous thing that it's hard to say yes or no to any particular aspect of it. All right, the time is running out, so I'm going to allow three more questions from the audience. Sergei, to your left. To your left, please. To your left, there's a gentleman in the striped shirt. Hello, uh, my name is uh, Misha Dubina. I'm from East European University, Cherkasy. So my question is, uh, well, um, don't, don't you think that uh, Wikipedia is the popular source of information with its specific uh, way of uh, depiction of the information uh, will become dominant in media sphere today and therefore will be the means of manipulating people? Mm. Well, I hope not. Uh, I mean, one of the interesting things about Wikipedia is that we really try, we don't do original reporting or original research, and I think that's a really important principle. Uh, what we try to do is integrate uh, information from reliable sources. Uh, certainly, uh, when we look at uh, Wikipedia entries, many times they're very, very popular, and so forces who want to manipulate information will find it an interesting target. But it's very difficult to do because everything in Wikipedia is transparent and open. Uh, people can challenge you on it. Uh, given the structure of saying uh, you must have reliable sources and so forth, then it's hard to deviate too far from what uh, you know good quality sources have said. Uh, it's probably much more effective to try to impact those good quality sources. Uh, you know, I, I had this question once from a, a magazine editor uh, in, in Russia, and I said, I think it's probably a lot easier to bribe a member of your staff to write something in your magazine uh, than it is to change something in Wikipedia where 50 community members are all going to say, wow, what is that? Where did you get that? You just made that up, you know? So I think we're resilient to that sort of thing. But I do think it's the kind of thing that we should all be aware of. I mean, if you, if you read a Wikipedia entry and you say to yourself at the end, wow, I mean, I know something about this topic and that entry is very biased please go to the discussion page and leave a note and say, hey, this is really biased. Uh, some administrators should look at it. Or even if you know more and you feel excited yourself, you know, say, well, you know, the New York Times reported this or the you know, Kiev Post reported, you know, bring in uh, other sources uh, because we really want to be neutral. And if you see something that's biased, obviously we, we think that's terrible. So, but it can happen, of course, yeah. Ksenia, <clears throat> anyone in your part of the hall? Yes. Yes, hello. My name is Katarina Harenko, and I'm a student of the Institute of International Relations of Taras Shevchenko National University of Kiev. And my question is as follows. Well, if, if Wikipedia is a, basically a char charity organization, and therefore um, I want to, to know your opinion of uh, famous investor Peter Thiel uh, suggesting to move the, some websites uh, server hardware to the open ocean to the open ocean yes where there is no government who is going to tax them and therefore minimizing the tax and besides uh, avoiding suing uh, the websites for copyrights so yeah. what do you think of it um. Well, I know Peter uh, Thiel, and he's a very exciting thinker, but he's also a little bit out there, I have to say. Um, so, I mean, I think that these issues of, of jurisdiction, so for us, uh, as Wikipedia, um, we, we don't face, I mean, our servers are based in the United States, for the most part, organizationally we're in the United States. The United States has the First Amendment. Uh, our legal protection for freedom of speech is quite good there. Uh, and within the US, we've never faced any kind of problem of any kind, and we wouldn't anticipate that we would. So for us, there'd be no real desire to think, oh, we should move to a server in the middle of the ocean. Uh, also, as we're a charity, we're not worried about taxes, so we don't think, oh, let's, let's do this. Um, you know, I think it's far more likely, I mean, the ocean's a pretty bad place to keep servers. There's water and, you know, it's a long way from electricity and so forth. Uh, I think it's more interesting to think about, is there an opportunity uh, for different jurisdictions to, be, to, to really 
fuel their internet sector and fuel the growth of the internet sector by having an uh, internet free trade zone. So maybe a country like the Ukraine could say, uh, actually, if Amazon and Google want to move their headquarters here, we're going to tax them at half the rate that they would be taxed in the U.S. Uh, maybe that would work, maybe not. I think it's, you know, I think it's valid for people to think about, uh, you know, governments today don't have the luxury of imagining that they can tax everything the way they would have liked to a long time ago. Big physical assets that you can't move out of the country, yes, you know, those are subject to political forces, but something that's so intellectual as the internet is, is quite fluid. I mean, take a look at Google, and I'm not defending Google, nor am I attacking them for this, but Google has a, a tax setup called uh, Double Irish for their offshore, everything out of the US, they run through Ireland and Holland or something, I don't know, it's quite complicated, but apparently they pay 1% uh, tax on all of their overseas earnings, and they're piling up a big pile of cash offshore that they'll have to pay tax on if they move into the US. I'm not a tax lawyer, I don't know. But I think, well, you have to expect this, and if, if Ireland closes the loophole, another country will say, hey, we want 1% of Google's money, so we'll do it. Uh, so I think we have to be realistic that these kinds of things will go on whether we like them or not. So there you go. But I, I don't think putting servers in the middle of the ocean is a good idea, I mean, from a physical point of view. I'm also using Wikipedia quite extensively, and I never thought about looking whether there's an entry in Wikipedia called Wikipedia. Is yes, there, there is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, it's, uh, we actually have, a, there's an entry in Wikipedia called Criticism of Wikipedia, which if you want to attack Wikipedia, the best place to go for source material is the entry in Wikipedia criticizing Wikipedia. It's quite good. It, it compiles every bad thing anybody ever said about us. So. Well, <laughs> I have to thank Jimmy Wales for the magnificent lecture for the thank article you. of on Wikipedia are you going to publish what you were telling us today publish are you going, what, what you were telling us today are you going to write a book about this <laughs> yeah write a book sounds great yeah yeah